The Broken Brain is encouraging raising funds and donating needed supplies to the YWCA of Nashville in Middle Tennessee. For this month, the month of May 2024, I'm plugging and plugging and plugging the wish list that you can make purchases on. It's an Amazon wish list with affordable items that you can send. You can send one, two, or a hundred of them, whatever is specified on there that they need and whatever you can give. If you go to ywcanashville.com slash donating, then you can find the Amazon wish list and make those purchases. Or you can make a direct donation there as well, and I'm encouraging everyone to do that. If you're not in a situation where you can make a monetary donation, uh, please share the website ywcanashville.com slash donating uh, on your social media. Uh, please, And thank you so much for doing that. One quick thing too, any new patrons to the show, if you sign up on the Patreon, patreon.com slash broken brain for the entire remainder of 2024, 50% of your monthly donation will go towards supporting uh, the, the shelter and outpatient programs there as well. And that's all the way to the end of 2024. If there are programs you'd like to see highlighted in future months or times, please hit me up at dwighthurst.com slash contact. This is something that all of us together can make a difference if we take the time to do it. The Broken Brain. Recording in progress. Welcome back, everybody, to the show. It's me, Dwight, here with The Broken Brain this week, bringing you a dose of health and wellness. And particularly today, we're getting all up into health and wellness. My guest today is Jeff Krasno, who is the the co-founder and CEO of Commune and also host of the Commune podcast, which will you can it'll tell us a little bit about that. Um You've created uh, a lot of different uh, wellness and protocols and recovery kind of oriented things for different kind of conditions that you call good stress, which is mm-hmm. leads right into a cool conversation that we're going to have about it. But first of all, Jeff, uh, thank you so much for being here. Hey, Dwight, it's such a pleasure to connect with you and to connect with your amazing community that you've built. Well, thank you. And. I, one of the things that I really love is bringing people to the listeners who have uh, different things. I One of the things I noticed as we were setting this up is you have a lot of really actionable kinds of like steps. You're very much a problem solver kind of personality when it comes to uh, and, and hope and having some hope and control and feelings of empowerment, especially when it comes mm-hmm. to our health and mental and physiological health is – why wow, that's that's just makes such a huge difference, you know, when when people have that versus when they don't. Um, what can you, uh, first of all, please introduce yourself and tell people a little bit about you and uh, your story and and what got you into worrying about people being healthy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, as usual, it's my wife's fault. Um, <laughs> she um, so uh, we've were childhood sweethearts and I've really been her torchbearer for, for now three and a half decades in some way or another. But um, kind of more specifically, I was in the music business and I was running a record company and a management company in New York City in downtown um, Manhattan um, when September 11th occurred. And in the wake of that tragedy, my wife did something unexpected and she started a yoga studio at Ground Zero. Um, it was in the same office building that where I had my record label. And um, she opened that in early 2002. And uh, I basically got this front row seat to seeing the power of community and yoga and sweat and a spiritual practice, how that can bring people together and help them heal and transform their lives. And so, you know, and this was not like a fancy yoga studio, like Equinox or anything. This was like a funky little one room studio with, you know, cockeyed floors and a, you know, bathroom, like barely the width of a bread box, you know, it's like, um, and, you know, after class, you know, people that basically were local, you know, all the denizens there of lower Manhattan that had gone through so much grief and collective grief, you know, would gather in this tiny little vestibule with sweaty lycra and open hearts. 
and, and really heal. And that um, had a, a, a really transformational impact on my life and uh, both personally and professionally. And from there, um, you know, I, I started this company called Wanderlust, which ended up being a very, very large um, festival company for for wellness. We sort of combined what a yoga conference in Lollapalooza might look like <laughs> into one thing, and we brought that all around the world. Um, and uh, and it was a, an incredible experience for for me and my family because we were traveling um, really extensively. But um, unfortunately, running a health and wellness company uh, was an adventure in wealth and hellness for me because I got incredibly mm. sick uh, during that process. And, you know, that kind of opened the door to kind of my, some personal healing um, that then I had to go through and face. And it was a huge eye opening experience and learning experience for me hopping into my own petri dish and doing a lot of me search uh so that's a, that's a little um snapshot you know now i've fortunately had the opportunity to um sort of distill all of the things that i've learned into you know what i do every day which is uh, i run uh, a company that is a wellness media company so we make you know online course content with incredible doctors and trauma-informed therapists, et cetera. And um, like Gabor Mate and, and other folks that you, and I'm sure some of your audience might be familiar with. Uh, and then, yeah, I get to host a podcast and talk to people 10 times smarter than me all the time. <laughs> I would say that's actually the best thing for me about doing a podcast is the people I get to meet and talk to, uh, some of the coolest People that you know that I've met in my life have come from being able to do this. It's, it's also mm -hmm. it's interesting when, uh, and I've been lucky enough to be around now to where a lot of times people you know will contact each other just as much often as I'll have to. But when I would and when I do hunt people down, right? You know when it's kind of like if if you hear something, and I'm sure you probably run into this when you hear of something cool. Someone's doing mm -hmm. this cool thing. Someone's, you know, on a different podcast or someone, uh, some video reel. It's like, that person seemed, I'm going to shoot them a message. Hey, do you want to, you know, because I'd like to get to know them anyway. I'd like to hear what they have to say. But saying I have a podcast, it's a legitimate way of connecting instead of just being like, hey, cool, you want to talk to me? You know, which <laughs> might be off putting. Um, but anyway, right. so meeting people, just like, yeah, it's we're doing the now. ultimate <laughs> door opener, right? Yeah. Um, it's nice. Yeah, totally. I, I, you know, I'm sure, you know, just from one podcast host to another, to pull back the curtain on the reality of, of the situation, it can sometimes be a slog. You know, there's a tremendous amount of research and reading and prep that goes into, you know, many of our episodes. Um, but I think, like you say, the payoff is so great because, you know, we have this, you know, deep personal connection for, you know, 60, 90 minutes at a time where we're absolutely completely present, you know, to the moment. We're not thinking about anything else or checking any other notification or email or text. We're just completely right here. And in fact, it, in some ways, it is a form of practice. Yeah. So it's interesting to me that you were running a wellness company and and felt, right, the, that there, there were elements of that. And uh, that point in your life, I guess, where you were having a lot of health problems and things yourself. Mm. Did, do you find, uh, did you have to change the way you were conducting your own management? Yeah. You're still managing a company. It's still, you still work yeah. in wellness, but did you have to look at if you were managing yourself in a wellness yeah. friendly way? Wellness friendly? I don't know. That's a good I question. mean, uh, yeah, all of the above, Dwight, candidly, I had to re-examine um, my approach to leadership I had to uh, re-examine, you know, my self-care practices or, or lack of self-care. Um, you know, there's this, you know, precept that crosses almost every spiritual tradition. It's called the golden rule, you know, love thy neighbor as thyself. You're probably familiar with it. Mm -hmm. And we, we think about that often in terms of how much we should love thy neighbor, but actually to really fulfill that equation we have to truly love ourselves. And, um, and for 
many people, me included, for decades, I was always at the bottom of my own priority list. Um, and, it, you know, I felt that you know, practices around self care were indulgent. And, you know, who was I? I was so privileged, you know, really everyone else should come first. Uh, the problem with that, even though the intention or the instinct might be a good one, is that you become relatively useless as a human being. Um, and you can't love your neighbor because you don't love yourself. And um, and so, you know, that was certainly part of, you know, the journey and remains part of the journey. You know, there's really just no terminus to this, you know, Dwight, I suppose there's there's the end of consciousness that might be coterminous with physical death. But but until that point, um, we are just a process. Uh, and that process could be, uh, is on a trajectory towards wholeness or healing, or it's on a trajectory towards illness or ailing. And what I came to learn is that I have a lot more agency than I ever thought over the direction of that trajectory. Mm -hmm. So what would you explain as the definition of good stress? We've hit mm -hmm. on that uh, sometimes mm -hmm. on the program, and it's one of the, it's uh, in my experience working in mental health and as a therapist, right, it's one of the things that's most fascinating to me is the, the vast difference in the type of way we experience stress. So what, what's, what's good stress? Yeah. Well, I think I saw somewhere in one of your interviews that you covered you stress, right? Um, and that's, uh, I suppose, the the Greek prefix uh, on, on stress. And that really points to kind of short, acute, often health-conferring stress. So I'll just give you sort of by analogy with an experience, you know, that, that I had of like about a week ago. I have these wonderful trails right near my house. Um, they are inundated with coyotes. So um, I went to, before a podcast to clear my head and uh, I was walking on this trail and my mom called and I have a new rule to myself is that anytime a member of my family calls, no matter what, I take the call. Um even if I can't really talk for very long, I don't get into like endless text things. I just take the call. And so even though I just wanted some peace and quiet, I took the call from my mom and, you know, I was just walking and she was talking as she often does. And I heard a, ru a rustling kind of in the bramble. And then right in front of me, maybe about 10 feet, there was a coyote. And he sort of eyed me as potential lunch <laughs> briefly. <laughs> and, um, of okay. course, you know, at that moment, uh, I hung up the phone immediately. And my body had an inv involuntary adaptive stress response, right? So what happened? Well, we all kind of know this by, by our own direct experience, right? So my heart started pounding, my breath rate accelerated, you know, my pupils dilated, I became very, very focused, but then sort of underneath the crust of consciousness, there's all this stuff happening in my body, you know, there's a kind of cortisol starts coursing through your veins, it tells your liver to release glucose, to send it to your muscles, to, you know, this is the normal fight or flight of uh, stress response. And so, I stayed, I didn't fight, obviously, in that particular case. I didn't fly. I kind of just stood my ground, and the coyote then just took a look and then just kind of went back off into the woods. And a couple minutes later, like, my body returned to homeostasis, to equilibrium. That is a completely adaptive response to stress. It comes and it goes, the problem with modern society is that the coyote really never leaves. So for so many of us under, you know, neglect or abuse or constant work pressure or endless work hours, or we're subject to 24 hour news cycles and social media that are essentially geared to leverage our human negativity bias to make us chronically stressed. That stress response never, 
never goes away. And that is patently bad stress and maladaptive stress. So I won't go into the physiology too deeply, and I'm sure your audience knows some of this, but when you have you know, chronic high cortisol levels, not only do you just feel irritable, but it has all sorts of downstream negative impacts. It raises blood glucose in, you know, your serum blood levels go way up, um, your glucose levels. So it can lead to insulin resistance and prediabetes and eventually potentially diabetes. Elevated cortisol levels also degrades the immune system. You produce less innate immune cells like neutrophils and monocytes and macrophages. And then at the same time, it degrades or creates dysbiosis in your gut. So it disrupts the you know, the balance of bacteria in your gut that can lead to what is known as leaky gut, which then creates in high levels of inflammation. So you have an agitated immune system and a depressed immune system at the same time. And your body basically just goes haywire. And we see this because stress, psychological stress is so connected to so many physiological and mental disorders at this juncture. We know that we can draw a straight line from one to the other. So this is what bad stress is. And unfortunately, too many of us are, are familiar um, with, with that phenomenon. You know, good stress is very, very different. It's the self-imposition of short-term deliberate stress. And it turns out that engaging in these good stress protocols align ourselves with how we evolved. Because if you think about what life was like on the Serengeti 12,000 BC, it was brimming with harsh, sometimes very inhospitable stressors, right? So we were accustomed to dealing with a scarcity of food or a paucity of, of available calories. So, but our bodies then evolved in relation to that scarcity and we learned how to store fat. So storing fat, for example, was very, very adaptive because it helped us prepare for winter's fallow, right? Um, we also had to endure all sorts of massive fluctuations in temperature. We didn't have a nice little digital thermometer <laughs> on our hut. Um, so we had to get accustomed to wicked cold and wicked heat. And that led to other adaptive advantages. You know, we built resilience. We built better metabolic health through subjection to cold and heat. And there's all sorts of things that you can point to. You know, obviously, life on the Serengeti was full of physical labor. We walked six to 10 miles per day. We lifted heavy things. We didn't live like sedentary indoor desk jobs. And so really, what I started to realize is that these good stressors actually align our bodies with their innate engineering that happened over hundreds of thousands of years of Homo sapiens history and millions of years of, of hominid history. And I began to codify those protocols into a program, an evolving program that I call good stress that addresses a lot of these, you know, evolutionary mismatches. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, of course, we don't catch up in a generation or so, like evolutionarily, right? So, <laughs> like the yeah. brain that we formed and things. I remember reading once where, you know, as soon as the light bulb became available, one of the next things that we invented was shift work, right? If you think about it. Yeah. You know, right. To where 100%. Now our sleep patterns are very different. And, um, you know, even the way we sleep, it used to be, you know, even in the early days that pre-industrialization and stuff, it was normal for people to kind of go to bed as the sun went down, and then they'd often wake up a few hours later and be awake for a few hours and then go back to sleep. There were two sleep shifts that naturally occurred, they think. And so then we start sort of screwing around with that as soon as we can. And now, of course, we can answer emails and texts and whatever it is. We can set up, you know, 
uh, whatever appointments and things just all the time. And we're not made to do that all the time. And, and, and just kind of what we're engaged with and what we're plugged into and unplugging from that. And yeah, it isn't, we aren't geared towards that. That's not our, uh, uh, that, that's not our orientation. Um, mm-hmm. And I feel like, yeah, there isn't necessarily the differentiation when we look at that when it comes to stress. In fact, sometimes stress is almost a status symbol or an assumption that, well, that's just, you know, that's how it is. And look at me, I'm going a million miles and isn't my life crazy? Like it's a badge of honor sometimes, right? Yeah. I mean, Dwight, you put your thumb on so many different insights there. Um, First of all, yes, I'm not an evolutionary biologist, but from what I remember of biology, genes take a long time to change. (laughs) Yes. So, you know, if you look at the cresting tsunami of mental disorders and chronic diseases in our culture now in comparison to where they were 50 or 60 years ago, you can't really point to the underlying genome. The genome has stayed the same. What hasn't stayed the same is culture, right? The way we live, our lifestyles. And so, you know, I think your point there is is right on. I mean, as it pertains to things like disruption of sleep and the epidemic of insomnia that we're we're looking at right now, yeah, that has everything to do with kind of innovation around light. And I put innovation in in air quotes. Obviously, right now, there's about eight screens around me <laughs> right now. There are all and they're available to me at any time. In fact, you know, I could watch Curb Your Enthusiasm on one. <laughs> I could watch, you know, YouTube on another or That's whatever. What that is in the background. I was wondering yeah. what that music was. <laughs> That's right. It's Larry <laughs> David again, uh, undermining me. Um <laughs> as he's apt to do. Um but you know, this you know, the the ease and convenience and comfort of 24-7 on-demand entertainment is wonderful on some level because I love Larry David as much as you might, but he's an endocrine disruptor. <laughs> if um, Amongst other things, it's always Larry's fault. Um, but, you know, more seriously, we have... Uh, we're engineered to have a certain circadian rhythm, and that circadian rhythm is set through getting subjection to the right kind of light at the right time of day. And when we disrupt that kind of light and we take blue light into the inferior part of our retina at night, we confuse our engineering and we say, hey, release cortisol when we should be releasing melatonin. So we are designed to get a good night's sleep, but then culture hijacks that design. And you can point your finger in a thousand directions, you know, where it does that. So, you know, I think you're, you, you kind of nailed it um, (laughs) with your comments there. Well, it's this kind of like, in a way it reminds me of take like uh, opiate uh, analgesia, they say, where if you take painkillers too long, Mm -hmm. your body starts hurting more to compensate for it. And, 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 you know, you take something like media, which we use to unwind. I know I do. Right. And, uh, and of course, it's amazing how accustomed we get to being like, well, I walk into to the restaurant and they're like, your food's not quite ready yet for takeout. And so I'm like, okay, what's the next thing? It's in my hand. I don't remember pulling my phone out. I just did. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah. when we're using that to unwind, but it's actually winding us up is what you're describing. Sometimes the very things that I reach yeah. for for a comfort <laughs> are are actually providing some of the difficulty in finding comfort. Yeah, it is ironic that Chronic ease leads to chronic disease, but it's true. Oh, I like that. Uh, I like that phrase, disease or dizzy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, that's clear. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's it's a lot better when I hang a lantern on it. But I'm a I'm a <laughs> I'm addicted to <laughs> clever wordplay. I love uh, uh, clever things like that. So that's a great that's a great way to put it. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, as you say, we're we're just not um, comfortable with being bored anymore. Right. But we were not designed to take in this onslaught of information that is so concomitant with the attention economy. We were just simply not designed for it. So, you know, when we see ourselves, you know, having, you know, panic attacks, for example, well, it doesn't 
take, you know, a Nobel laureate to connect the dots here is that if you are always staring at a screen that is essentially designed to dysregulate your nervous system, what is going to happen? Well, we're seeing that. I have three daughters, man. You know, it's, and I know a lot about this stuff, you know, but it is, it's tough, man. It's tough for, for kids, um, particularly growing up in this kind of environment. And, and I think, Dwight, the other thing that you alluded to, which I find so disturbing, is that we have essentially normalized the abnormal. You know, this idea that like being like, quote unquote, stressed out and sleepless and having chronic fatigue and brain fog and irritability and the inability to concentrate and the need to check our phone every two seconds, like we've essentially completely normalized that. In fact, we just can often write that stuff off as like, oh yeah, I'm just having a little bit of a bad day or whatever. But let me tell you, Dwight, like those symptoms that I just described, they are an angel's breath, or I should say maybe a devil's breath away from diabetes and dementia and heart disease. They are just upstream. So this is why I'm so passionate, candidly, about trying to get some of these points across. Because honestly, when I survey our country uh, and the world, since we're actually very good at exporting our lifestyle around the world, um, you know, what I see is just an epidemic of chronic disease. And I, I believe it's at the core of, of many of the world's problems. I mean, even honestly, our political discourse, I think, is inflamed. I think our the inflammation that we have in our personal bodies spills over into the body politic. I mean, if you get up and you have three chronic conditions and can't afford your insulin and don't have insurance and you're working two part-time jobs in a town that's been boarded up and your only access for food is 7-Eleven, you're probably pissed off. <laughs> so I really think... to engage? I mean, then you're also... Yeah. And you, you know, we can go, I won't get too lost in the weeds with particular perspectives, but I will say that you are more apt to be manipulated, whether it's by politicians or people selling you stuff or whatever, um, or, and also to make poor decisions and to be angry at those that feel differently than you. And we see a lot of those things accelerating, yeah. you know, nowadays. Um, so, as we see this growing problem, what are some of the things that you advocate for people? If people say, I want to get up tomorrow and do it differently, or maybe maybe we start with going to bed differently, but you can you can yeah. guide us that way. What are some yeah. things you tell people to do? Well, on some level, I, I, I ask people to ask this simple question. Uh, if I want to be healthy and I want to feel great, then ask this question. How did I evolve? And when you ask that question, it really can inform so many different behaviors um, and, and help you take agency over your own health care and, and take it back from insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies and you know and you know, honestly, just the medical care industry that is just so broken that really is just hell-bent on treating the symptoms of disease generally with drugs and not addressing really what the root cause of many of our pathologies are. So ask yourself that question as it pertains to food, let's say. Well, how did I evolve? Well, I evolved pro like primarily as an opportunistic omnivore. I ate 800 different kinds of plants and seeds and tubers and roots of all different colors. And I ate some, you know, wild game, you know, when it came along. So, you know, lean protein, et cetera. When did I eat? Well, I certainly did not eat every second of the day. You know, I, I was at a Denny's like a couple of years ago. I don't spend a lot of time at Denny's, but 
you know, uh, Dwight, I, I will inform you that there are now. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I will now inform you that there are currently four meals per day. There are no longer three meals. Uh, there is <laughs> breakfast served all day. Thank God. Lunch, dinner, and now late night. Late um, night. Right. Yeah, late night is it. Was it Taco Bell that introduced the. Co- I remember seeing the commercial where it's like fourth meal. I'm like, oh, is that oh, what we're. You're like, like is that what we really so. need? <laughs> Um, so yeah, I mean, we evolved to endure periods of some scarcity, as I, as I mentioned before, and now we have to self-impose some of that scarcity in order to be well. So for me, that looks like an intermittent fasting protocol. Like I consolidate my consumption of food generally in an eight to nine hour window every day. And there's Tons of good reasons um, to do that from, you know, weight management to insulin sensitivity to the production of new mitochondria to the production of new neurons. There's so many to the uh, activation of, of autophagy, sort of the breaking down of dysfunctional cells. But more than anything, fasting is really a mindset that um it can really punctuate other elements of your life a lot of people associate fasting obviously with food but you know Dwight I think this is a, a place where you know physiology really bridges into psychology so w- when I adopted a fasting protocol it didn't mean that I didn't get hungry in the other 16 hours, I did, you know, it would be 9 p.m. and it would be outside my eating window and I would get hungry. But I became sort of a, a disciple to the practice. And instead of just mindlessly, unconsciously walking over to the cupboard and grabbing a bag of chips the way I normally would have, I had to witness the nature of the hunger, right? So, and and Viktor Frankl, who's this wonderful writer, he wrote Man's Search for Meaning. He has this very famous quote, which I'm sure you're familiar with, which is, you know, between stimulus and response, there is a space, and in that space lies our freedom, our liberation. It's a little bit longer than that, but I'll just paraphrase. And And so I actually had to examine the nature of the stimulus, the hunger, And instead of unconsciously, mindlessly reacting to it and just going and get some food, I actually had to witness it and delineate between that feeling as a biological need or as an emotional or psychological desire. And I found that space through this practice in order to really untangle that. And I will say that 95% of the time I found that I was eating my feelings or I was bored or someone insulted me or something. And I was eating for psychological reasons. And I will say the refinement of that skill of that mindset, then begin to bleed or or punctuate other parts of my life such that like when my kids did something incredibly aggravating as they are apt to do, uh, instead of just reacting, I had to examine the nature of the stimulus of their behavior. And instead of just lashing out, just be like, well, wait a minute, what would be the origin of that behavior? Why are they acting that way? And what is the appropriate response? You know, and again, like I started using this skill as it pertained to drinking or shopping or, you know, whatever your peccadillo or your perfidy is, you know, this became so, so useful. Um, And uh, so I, I really feel like, you know, that the self-imposition of of scarcity in one's life can build, uh, can provide that space essentially between stimulus and response. And and there is a tremendous amount of freedom in it. That's, that reminds me of, uh, as a colleague of mine, David Livingston is his name. He's uh, Mm. one of the co-hosts of, of another podcast that I am, I've mentioned it on here before. It's it's put on by the Wiseman Method, uh, rapid detoxification 
clinic mm. in Los Angeles, where you are. But oh, cool. um, anyway, David is a great therapist. He helps people to transition from being like, you know, going through opioid use disorder to going through a, and sobriety. But one of the things that I've heard him talk about many times is the usefulness of boredom. And he talks to people mm. about this, of like how if there's addictive practices, and this is a clinic that goes way beyond just the idea of just opiates. They, they look at it as a medical treatment, and they take a medical eval of, of everything. So, But anyway, just I guess I say that just to, to mention David's mindset is saying not just the drugs, but other practices that we do to fill the void of boredom, it's sometimes better to have that boredom because then we, boredom will breed cleverness is the way he yeah. describes that, right? Mm. Um, and I think it's a powerful concept to say, as you put it, I, and I really like your term, imposed scarcity, because if I'm not eating, i got to do something. And as you put it, confronting that, right, and actually emotionally processing, why am I doing this? What am I trying to escape from or maybe create that it's not Yeah, really well, yeah, I mean, I've, I haven't thought about it in these terms before, but you could also apply that concept of imposed scarcity on media or right. And so in, instead of like you're waiting in, in the line at the grocery store, instead of taking another, you know, dopamine hit on Instagram, you know, just be present to your situation, you know, to the, person at the register or the person in front of you or the person behind you, et cetera. What is going to be your, the state of your nervous system if you do that? Probably very chill and relaxed, what might be called sort of ventral vagal, you know, where you become open, the, your sort of aperture of attention widens, you know, you become more attuned, more relatable, and it's in that place of safety and security where you build relationship and and generally find creativity and, and wisdom. And and you know, we are a a culture that is obsessed with filling every empty space, but wisdom comes in the spaces right so we need to we need to let it be we need to open the possibility for more wisdom what do you say when people are struggling with getting started on something like this as mm. you put it you know you pushed ahead into you know getting to where you're boy this is actually feeling like it's helping me i'm processing these things we we have such a hard time starting Anything uh, that can be, you right, healthy practices, especially when it comes to imposing scarcity, yeah. as you put it, or, or changing what we're doing, right? Yeah. Well, what's the quote? A journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step, right? Sure, yeah. And this is, you know, I didn't... So, for example, like I'm a daily cold plunger. Okay. Um, I abhor the cold. I literally hate the cold, Dwight. I hate it almost more than anything. But I didn't start cold plunging with 34 degree water. You know, I started with 60 degree water for 30 seconds. And that even felt subjectively incredibly uncomfortable, but uncomfortable to the place where I could do it. And slowly, over time, decreased temperature and increased duration of my cold plunge. Okay? We don't have to get into all the benefits of cold plunging. It's fantastic. A lot of people but are yeah, point, doing that, either that or even yeah. a cold, just a swim or, yeah, kind of a thing. Sure. Yeah, well, I mean, for mental health there are, and mood regulation, yeah. it's it's pretty incredible. It will stimulate the release of dopamine. Mm over a 48 hour period and obviously in a very adaptive way because it's also incredibly uh metabolically um you know positive 
So there's a lot of very negative behaviors that also uh, trigger the activation of dopamine, right? So dopamine is sort of a Jekyll and Hyde sort of neurotransmitter. But this is a very, very positive way. And so cold plunging um, honestly can be a great therapy uh, for addiction and recovery for that very reason, because neurochemically it seems to have a very, very, uh, like a response um, that is not dissimilar from drugs and alcohol. Um, so, but that being said, you know, really the question, the, the first question was, how do you start? So four years ago, I was 210 pounds. I had all those shitty symptoms of modernity, chronic fatigue, brain fog, et cetera. I found out that I was diabetic. Um, I ran a wellness company, Grant, you know, mind you. <laughs> and, um, And then I became one of these statistics. You know, I was living in the nightmare. But I had to start somewhere, you know. And the place to start was tiny, tiny little steps. I mean, I didn't go into like a 16-8 fasting protocol on day one. I just went into like, okay, I'm not going to eat for 12 hours today. I can manage that today, right? I'm going to take a cold shower for 20 seconds just today. Just today. That's it. I'm going to go on a walk after every meal for 10 minutes today. I can manage that, right? And when over time you start to stack these things up and you start to take inventory of yourself and you're like, oh my God, I've created an upward spiral in my life. Like we almost always think of spirals as downward and they are, there are plenty of downward spirals. We've all experienced them at points in our life. I'm sure many people listening have experienced a downward spiral. I'm here to tell you that upward spirals are just as possible. It's interesting how we overcome. There's some kind of a hurdle to anything healthy, um, I think to where we do it enough times that it becomes somewhat self-reinforcing. I, I know when I, mm-hmm. I've uh, been through periods of time where I've done something like running, for example, I used to run pretty often. And even though running, you know, that's the old joke, running's the worst, right? I mean, everybody knows that it, it always sucks. Right. But yet I got to a point where I look forward to it for the mental and, and physiological kind of muscular feelings, you know, that you get afterwards. Um, because, it, you know, for various reasons, it was a break from the day. It got me up and moving around and um, felt better after that kind of thing. But it takes a minute to get to that point uh, where it's yeah. not just awful. And yeah. and enough to where even the parts that remain awful or hard work <laughs> or whatever um, are overshadowed by what's enjoyable about it. Or I, I guess as you're putting it, it's like you didn't st- you didn't start describing cold plunge by saying like, now I like it. It's It's... But it sounds like you like some of the things that it does for you. And that makes it, does that make it more tolerable to be able to jump in the cold water because the effects now are reinforcing? Yeah. Uh, I think once it would become comfortable, it would lose its benefits, candidly. I see. And so I think we have to become comfortable with discomfort. And cold water is actually a good example because it's incredibly subjective. You know, what's cold to me might not be cold to you and vice versa. And the amazing thing about cold is that you can get all the benefits at any temperature provided that it actually feels cold. But here's the other place where... I find cold therapy to be so interesting. Um, Again, like it's similar to the coyote. What happens when you get in to a cold plunge? Well, take a big deep breath, right? Takes your breath away. Your heart rate goes boom, 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 boom. There's epinephrine coursing through your veins. You almost feel it coming up like you're going to have a panic attack. And then... You have a moment, you have some space where you leverage your neomammalian prefrontal cortex 
and you put top-down pressure on this bottom-up involuntary response. And you say, I have this tool. I can regulate my breath. Let me do it. Hmm. Ah, it ties okay. into, yeah, no, it really ties into some of the uh, uh, ways that people will train for meditative breathing. Box breathing is one, belly breathing, controlled breathing, where a lot of them involve, uh, obviously, deeper breathing than you usually would do, but a lot of them involve uh, some at least of a few seconds of holding breath in between breaths, mm-hmm. in between breathing in, hold it, breathe out, hold it. Those are some of the more simple calming, self-calming techniques. And that's how I've heard that explained from a doctor before too, is that you're initiating, even if it's just a little, you're triggering a part where you're, there's like a little bit of like, hey, what, 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 what's going on? There's a physiological response to like not having air coming in and then you're letting go. So it emphasizes a lot of different things psychologically as well. Yeah, well, you're taking something that is generally happening subconsciously, like your breath, and you're putting conscious control over it and such that you are moving your body back into a regulated state. And if you can do that day in and day out in cold water, you can also do it when something else stressful enters your life when you don't expect it. So really what this is, is training yourself for a certain amount of resilience and emotional regulation such that when someone cuts you off in traffic or you get insulted or something very legitimately stressful happens in your life, that you have a tool to put top-down pressure onto that involuntary response and bring yourself back into an emotionally regulated place. It is an incredibly useful skill. Mm-hmm. Well, so you've got uh, right away some things people are able to do to kind of start out as you put it, that we're kind of looking at. And I love principles that we can apply, by the way, that kind of like a uh, uh, experiential scarcity that we can impose, uh, you know, mm-hmm. on ourselves and mm-hmm. our lives and things like that. Um, what's the role of involvement of people around you having a community or a support system? Like, uh, you know, let's say somebody has their family or partner or whatever, and maybe they're not quite like, well, I'm not going to jump in the cold water myself, but how can they, how important is that kind of support or communication in this? Well, community in general is one of the biggest determinants of health and well-being. You know, of course, again, we ask ourselves, how did we evolve? Well, we evolved living communally. We literally raised each other's children. Um, And, you know, there's all these kind of studies now that have come out on the impacts of loneliness Uh, which seems kind of rampant in our society at this juncture that there's one out of BYU that essentially uh, claims that loneliness is as big of a determinant of all-cause mortality as smoking 16 cigarettes a day Hmm. Um, and, and more dangerous than obesity or alcoholism. So, you know... We tend to think that we can go at our own uh, in, in modern life, and certainly we have sanctified, you know, the individual in, in our modern culture. Um, but we know through any cursory look at evolution, but also at some of the more recent studies about these places in the world called blue zones that are, you know, the places that have the the highest concentration of centenarians, that community is completely central to being well and and healthy. And there's even this emerging field called sociogenomics that essentially tracks the um, effect of social connections on your genetics, on the expression of your particular genes you know, such that when you are kind of, when your social needs are met by your social connections, you know, your epigenetic expression is going to be way, way healthier. And I'll just kind of 
you know, punctuate this point by saying, you know, I, I interviewed this guy named Robert Waldinger maybe last year. He runs the longest and most thorough longitudinal study on human happiness at, at Harvard University. And they've been studying this group of Harvard sophomores and a control group since I think the late thirties. And, um, they found that the number one determinant of longevity and happiness was the strengths of one's social connections, period. So, you know, the, the notion, you know, of building community is central. I mean, obviously, I, I called my company Commune <laughs> for a reason. Um, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but, of course, like, you know, I think, you know, we, we've yet to fully understand you know, the impact that the shelter in place and quarantine um, regulations during COVID ha have had, you know, certainly we're beginning to see kind of the ramifications on, on our young people, but also just at society at large in terms of, you know, this loneliness epidemic, you know, and of course, like we can hold ourselves up in boxes, inside of boxes, inside of boxes, like single family homes and, you know, gated communities and picket fences and, you know, order everything in on Amazon from the palm of our hand and sort of live under the delusion that we are not interdependent with the world around us. Um, but we do that really at, at our own risk. Pretty much. In fact, I have a friend who's a manager and in his, uh, he was looking into lots of research, just talking the other day, he said that, uh, research indicates that, uh, People prefer, they think that they prefer working at home, but yet if they don't have at least a couple days a week of some of mm -hmm. that interaction in that, uh, you know, the, the morale just plummets and, and that there are those things. So there are times, once again, where we, we kind of can even self-medicate with solitude and subjective. Some people do better with some of that than others and recharge the batteries. But if we're, if we're just recharging the batteries and not using the energy, right? then the thing we're comforting ourselves with uh, can actually be to our detriment, as you put it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously there, there's an important delineation between chosen solitude, right? This notion of being sort of comfortable with one's self and not being lonely with oneself and, and living a, you know, a self-examined and, and spiritual life, which is very important candidly, a lot of my deepest feelings of connection come within chosen solitude. But then, you know, there's a very, that's very different than actually being lonely of not spending time, you know, really working on building your social connections to meet your social needs. You know, you know, in my program, I actually outline what I call a social fitness regimen um, because in this day and age, candidly, we need to exercise our social biceps in, in the same way that we need to exercise like literally our physical biceps uh, because we've become so removed from from socialization. And so, you know, there's a lot of, you know, just techniques. I, I actually, I think I revealed one at the beginning when I, when I said like, I always answer the phone now when a member of my family calls, it's so easy to look at your phone and be like, Oh, there's dad or there's my brother, whatever. And he just goes directly to voicemail. Like I'm busy. I'll get back to them later. You know, I get it. Um, but what if you just picked up the phone for 30 seconds and say like, my daughter called me this morning. I was really busy in the middle of some other conversation. I just said, Hey, hold on one second. My daughter's calling. I picked up the phone. I say, Hey, Phoebe, I, I love you so much, but I just can't talk to you right now. I'll call you back in 30 minutes. And she said, okay, dad, I love you too. Just that, just that it, it, you, you stack those little behaviors up and it really begins to, to perfume your life. Yeah. Huh. Instead of scheduling yourself an expectation obligation for later <laughs> that you will, yeah. if you're me, well, that you that, will forget that that would be my, well, the way my it, brain works. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Well, how many, I mean, and just practically, how many times have we then gotten into like this 50 texts back and forth to talk to someone in three hours 
versus just, you know, picking up the phone and saying, hey, I'll call you at five. Um, so, Well, it's, yeah. it's very useful. As I said at the beginning, I think it's very powerful to have actionable steps we can use to empower ourselves. And you've given us a lot to work with. I want uh, you, you to have a chance to tell people to how to follow your work. Um, before that, I always like to ask people um, mm-hmm. if they have – some a community give back that they like, whether it's a nonprofit, a charity, or just a good practice for the community. Um, it does not have to be related to what we're talking about, but it can be. It's up to you. Mm-hmm. And then, and then, of course, kind of tell everybody where they can follow you and find you. But do you have any uh, thing like that that is uh, near and dear to your heart? Yeah, I, I have a couple. Thanks for asking that question. Um, I'm super into regenerative farming. Um, and, uh, I support a couple different groups. One's called kiss the ground. The other one is called farmer's footprint. Um, they help to, um, they help conventional farmers transition to regenerative practices. Um, and there's just so many reasons why that's a good idea. Um, that's a different podcast, but I'm happy to come on and talk about that sometime. That's cool. Yeah. And, and then, um, I'm, uh, fortunate to serve on a nonprofit board called Pure Edge that has developed a mindfulness and an socio-emotional learning program for kids, um, mostly elementary school, but K through 12, they give the curriculum away and uh, they go into public schools all across the country and, you know, teach our children tools to, to manage stress and anxiety. Um, so that's something I, I believe in, in deeply. I love that. Especially, yeah. Giving kids those tools. Pro- I'm glad to see that we are doing that a little more proactively and a I little see bit. That, yeah. I see <laughs> the trend. It's like, like so many things we know we should, and then hopefully then we start to do. So anything like that, that's happening, I think is really, is really powerful. What, mm-hmm. uh, where do people follow your work and how can they benefit from you yeah so well i i I do prowl the the serengeti of of social media mostly on instagram um so i'm just at 11 midnight 3 a.m yeah (laughs) try to avoid that um uh that's just at jeff krasno but uh most of my work is is concentrated on the commune platform so that's at one one commune.com i have a program up there which you can take the first half of it is totally free um it's called good stress i outline all of the practices uh and benefits of many of the protocols that we've talked about from heat and cold therapy to fasting to Oh, resistance training to even really tips and having how to have good, stressful conversations. That's a whole other world. That's a good one too. Um, yeah. And, uh, and like, uh, yeah, I host a podcast called the commune podcast and, you know, I, I get to have really just fascinating conversations there. So those are the, those are the primary places. Wonderful. And is that just one that's in all the podcast platforms out there? People can, yeah, yeah. every podcatcher. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, and to everybody out there, thank you so much for listening. And I'll also throw out my, as I always do, my website is DwightHurst.com, where you can learn more about the broken brain or my my practice that I do there. And there is a growing number of uh, resources that are available for you there, and uh, some some uh, also some uh, mental health courses and things that I'm putting up. I'm almost got uh, ready to post some of the. Uh, dialectical behavioral therapy. It's a self-study course for DBT skills that's going to be up mm-hmm. there uh, as well for people to learn something about those things. And just basically DwightHurst.com. Visit it, you know, daily. And uh, maybe not that often, but you can visit it whenever you <laughs> to see what we're adding there. So, Jeff, thanks again for being uh, for being here. Yeah, I loved it. Thank you, Dwight. And, and thank you for opening the doors to your community. I, I deeply appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Court and Parts Podcast Network. To listen to more Court and Parts shows, visit courtemparts.com.